Hello, hello, my dear fellow. Please be aware, the following review is not 100% correct. It is still way more than I had ever thought possible with just a few clicks. Thank you, Notebook LM, and thank you, Google. Ever devoured a book so good you just had to tell someone about it? <laughs> well, imagine getting your hands on that book before anyone else like a literary sneak peek. Yeah. That's what we're doing today with Unknown Son, a new fantasy novel by L.H. Chevalier. We've got excerpts from an advanced copy, and let me tell you, this story is a wild ride. It's got mystery fantasy and dives right into the action from the very first page. What's fascinating here is how Chevalier uses the dedication to hint at the book's core themes. Um, it's dedicated to those who change their destiny. Immediately, that makes you think about identity, especially with the title like Unknown Son. Right. It's like the author is setting the stage for a story about someone discovering your true self. And speaking of discoveries, the book opens with our main character, Enrael, waking up in the woods with absolutely no memory, a fresh bullet wound, and a very grumpy baron staring down at him. Talk about starting with a bang. It's a brilliant hook that immediately pulls you into the story. You've got the Baron Jeremy, who comes across as harsh, but later reveals a surprising depth. Then there's Anthony, the voice of reason, who seems to ground the Baron. And at the center of it all is Enriel the amnesiac with a mysterious past. And I have to say, even with all the intrigue and danger, Chevalier still manages to weave in humor. The Baron's constant worrying about Enriel running away had me chuckling. It's like he's adopted a particularly unpredictable stray cat. And then there's Anne, the Baron's daughter, who takes a uh, a unique approach to keeping Enriel close, tying him to her to prevent him from wandering off. That's certainly one way to handle things. It speaks volumes about her character. Resourceful, a little mischievous, and clearly not one to be trifled with. It's a good thing she's got a sense of humor. Because some of the situations are downright outlandish. Like, in real sleeping naked when Anne checks mm -hmm. on him. Okay, that's played for last. But it hints at something deeper, too. Like, he's just wired differently than everyone else in this world. Exactly. And it's not just implied. Several characters comment on how Enriel is different. His rapid healing tracking abilities and unusual strength. These are classic fantasy tropes, but they're presented as unusual even within the world Chevalier has built. It's like... Magic is a known quantity here, but Enriel is something uh, more. Right. And speaking of the world, I love how the author uses color to create this sense of duality, especially with the name The Deep. The Baron explains that it refers to their lands with green representing the forest and blue representing the sea. It's such a powerful visual motif. Blue and green appear everywhere, in clothing descriptions of the castle, even the surrounding landscape. It's almost like these colors represent opposing forces, maybe even hinting at the conflict within Enriel himself. We see these flashes of something primal, something dangerous lurking beneath the surface. Could this be symbolized by the untamed green of the forest juxtaposed with the calmer, more rational blue of the sea? And this is where things take a really interesting turn. Remember that scene by the river? Anne takes Enriel to the spot where he was found, hoping it will spark something in his memory. He touches a blood stain on the ground and bam, he's hit with this vivid vision of the past. But it's just a flash, no real memory surface. It's almost like his mind is holding back the information or maybe something else is blocking it. There's a sense of deliberate mystery there. What's also interesting is that we start to see Anne warm up to Emriel during this scene. She even uses a nickname, Really. It's a small detail, but speaks volumes about their growing connection. Right. And just as they're having this almost tender moment, this sudden banging sound throws Enriel into a complete frenzy. It's clearly more than just noise to him. It's like a physical assault. Chevalier really makes you feel that disorientation. Absolutely. It begs the question. Is this some kind of heightened sensory issue tied to his powers, or could something more sinister be at play? Is someone or something intentionally causing him this pain? The author leaves that open, which is brilliant, keeps you on the edge of your seat, and things escalate quickly from there. To say the least, Enriel completely snaps attacking the guards. Anne gets caught in the chaos, and the Baron is desperate to save his son, even if it means hurting him in the process. 
Talk about a moral dilemma, it highlights the inner conflict within the Baron. He's torn between his duty to protect his people and this paternal affection for Enriel despite the danger. And poor Anne. She's clearly drawn to Enriel, but this violent outburst leaves her terrified. It's such a powerful contrast the way Chevalier writes it. Mm. Enriel's violence is almost instinctual while the Baron is burdened by conscience and consequence. And then there's that brief scene with the farmer's family. Remember how Enriel is drawn to their simple happiness? He has this chilling thought about their blood. It's a chilling reminder that whatever darkness simmers beneath Enriel's surface, it's deeply intertwined with the very essence of life itself. It makes you question. Is he inherently dangerous, or is there a way for him to control this power? So we've got this building mystery surrounding Enriel's past and the source of his powers, coupled with the very real danger he presents. And right when you think it can't get more complicated, Chevalier throws another curveball our way. Enriel wakes up again, this time next to a dead deer covered in blood. It's a gruesome image, and it's meant to be. This time, though, the blood triggers something. He gets these flashes of what seems like a past life on a farm with friends, but are they real memories or something else entirely? It's so unsettling the way these visions come and go. Mm -hmm. They're like pieces of a puzzle, but don't quite form a clear picture. And that contrast between the farm and the Baron's castle is deliberate, right? It's like representing two totally different paths for Enriel. Exactly. You've got this simple, almost idyllic life on the farm, a stark contrast to the opulence and inherent violence of the castle. This highlights Enriel's internal struggle. He's drawn to the idea of belonging, the peace he seems to have experienced on the farm, yet he's increasingly aware of the darkness within himself. So we've got Enriel grappling with these fragmented memories, this pull towards a simpler life, but also this looming sense of dread. And it's at this point that he makes a decision. He decides to return to the castle. Which is fascinating, right? You'd think he'd run as far away from the castle as possible. But it's almost as if he's seeking something there, perhaps answers, or maybe even a sense of belonging, twisted as it may be. It's a classic case of out of the frying pan into the fire. Because no sooner does he return than he stumbles headfirst into a whole new mess. He finds an open gate, a clear path to escape. And for a moment you think... This is it, he's finally free. But fate, as it often does, has other plans. He runs into Dane the Maid and gets hit with a bombshell. Everyone thinks he killed the Baroness. Oh, talk about a gut punch. Remember how we discussed Anne's reaction to Enriel's outburst? It turns out in all the chaos, she saw him running away covered in blood and assumed the worst. A classic case of misunderstanding with tragic consequences. And poor Dane... She's caught in the middle of it all, terrified of Anne, terrified of the Baron, yet still trying to help Enriel. She's such an intriguing character. She provides these moments of comic relief with her stammering and clumsiness. But underneath it all, she's incredibly brave and loyal. Absolutely. And her loyalty ends up playing a crucial role in the story. Remember when she overhears the Baron and Anthony discussing their plan to deal with Enriel? It's chilling how they talk about him as a threat that needs to be eliminated. Mm -hmm. The Baron even prepares poison just in case. It's a turning point in the story. Dane, bless her heart, risks everything to warn Anne. And Anne, in her own resourceful way, hatches this daring plan to escape and save Enriel. That scene where she tricks Iva with the promise of bread. Pure genius. Talk about using what you've got. Yeah. But of course it wouldn't be a good story without a few more twists and turns, right? Right. Just when you think Anne is going to pull off this daring escape, she encounters a new obstacle. The captain... He's suspicious of her from the start, watching her every move. It's a battle of wits between them. Yeah. Anne tries to play it cool using her charm and intelligence to distract him, but the captain is no fool. He sees right through her act and throws her in the dungeon. It's a brilliant twist that raises the stakes even higher. Now with Anne trapped and the Baron convinced that Enriel is a deadly threat, the stage is set for a final confrontation. And what a confrontation it is. The Baron, driven by duty and despair, sets off with his men to hunt Enriel down. It's heartbreaking, because even as he's preparing to fight, you can see the internal conflict eating away at him. He's sending Enriel to his potential death, but there's also this sense of grief, of love, woven into his actions. This internal struggle is mirrored in the final battle itself. 
Chevalier uses these incredibly vivid, almost cinematic descriptions to convey the raw power of Enriel's abilities, the desperation of the Baron's last stand. It's brutal heart-wrenching and completely impossible to put down. And just when you think it's over, Enriel seems to die. But, and this is where Chevalier throws his final curveball, Enriel is revived. He's transformed even more powerful and terrifyingly changed. This isn't the lost boy who woke up in the woods anymore. This is something else entirely. It's both a classic resurrection scene and a complete subversion of the trope. Enriel is reborn, but it's not a triumphant return. It's a terrifying evolution that speaks to the idea that some destinies can't be escaped no matter how hard you try to fight them. And as if that wasn't enough, we're left with a gut-wrenching cliffhanger. Enriel, overwhelmed by guilt and the realization of what he's become, tries to end his own life. But even that fails. He's left to grapple with his own existence, this terrifying power he can't seem to escape. It's a story that stays with you long after you finish reading it. Unknown Son is a complex tapestry of identity destiny, and the ever blurry line between good and evil Chevalier masterfully blends action intrigue and these incredibly poignant moments of human connection that leave you breathless. It's a story that begs the question, what would you do if you discovered a darkness inside yourself that you couldn't control? And that's what makes it such a captivating read. You find yourself questioning your own moral compass, your own capacity for both light and shadow. If you're looking for a story that will stay with you long after you've turned the final page, look no further than Unknown Son, trust us, you won't be disappointed.